it's a problem. Okay, got it. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all. This we week, are, we're, we going to, we we're going to continue Ayatul Kubra, Supreme Sign. Um, although last week we started with the introduction of this um, Supreme Sign, and we mentioned that this is somewhat popular, one of the popular treaties uh, among writings of uh, Sayyid Nursi. But also by his mentions, this is somewhat a difficult one. And also he just admits or conveys the message that maybe not all of us will be able to grasp um, all, all the depths, all the information and wisdom provided here, but uh, we will get the benefit. Um, Having said so, this week um, we have Colin Turner, Colin Hojam, once again. Thanks for you know uh, contributing continuously to this meeting. I think uh, this is this is jam for us, so we we benefit a lot. And uh, Mustafa Tuna, uh, Mustafa Tuna Hojam, also from um, from United States, is uh, joining today. Um, and I will try to just be very minimalistic from my side so that you know we can we can hear what they say about subframe sign uh, Mustafa Jam, you were not here last week so I want to ask you from the beginning how do you um how do you understand how do you position the subframe sign uh, for example last week Fatih Atalay uh, be mentioned this is kind of autobiography of Said Nursi and I like that very much and this is the fact that you know this part is included in uh, biography of Said Nursi too. So, um, but um, how how can we understand what what is the point of this Risali in the first place? Why it is important and what does it say in general? How do you, how do you understand in general? Yes, salam alaikum. Um, I I like the idea of this like autobiographical reading. I think we can read every uh, you know work of that. Bedou Zaman Said Nursi as an autobiographical work, if, especially if we can, uh, you know, pinpoint the time that it was written and also trace its origins in his uh, other works. Um, this may be autobiographical, this may also be related to, you know, what in the tradition has been called Seyrus Luke, that is spiritual voyaging or spiritual uh, wayfaring. Right, uh, you know, we we know very little about that because you know it is something that happens in a metaphysical realm that unless you have access to it, it's uh, you know you don't have any points of reference to uh, talk about it. And when it is articulated, it's articulated in a meta uh, metaphorical uh, language. Uh, but from the little I have read and heard about these things, it does involve a uh, an increase in in the wayfaring person's cognizance about the um, cosmos. And then at some point you transcend that and you reach you know, things beyond that. But you know, where you start, it does involve an increased cognizance, increased recognition, awareness uh, of everything out there. Uh, you know, one particular example that comes to mind is, um, I won't be able to remember his name. It's, it's just blanking out. But one of the really important leaders mm -hmm. of uh, revival in African Islam, uh, where he talks about this this process, and he says, uh, you know, there was a point where I could feel every molecule or every ad atom, you know, out there in the uh, cosmos, and I could like have a an awareness of them equally, as as though I was looking at my uh, the tips of my fingers, my fingertips. Um, so. When, and I have been involved in the translation of uh, Ustad Nosi's short treatises that were written in 1919 and 1922 in that like very brief period, which appears to be a period of uh, spiritual awakening. Uh, and you know, if you want to use the language, say Rus Luke uh, for Ustad Nursi, and you can have you know parallels between this Ayatul Kubra and some of the text that's in there. So in that sense, it's very interesting to think of this as an autobiographical uh, text, or we can also say it is a text that is not theoretical, it is uh, you know, experiential. Uh, he 
he writes this with the with the knowledge of haqq al yaqeen right the the truth of uh, certainty or reality of certainty um so that's one thing that comes to mind another thing is um this actually looks very simple and easy uh, you know, when i read it at least it, it appears to me that it's very simple and easy like i look at the text and i look at outside and what he says there i see outside in the world so there are clouds i look out and i see the clouds there are stars he, you know i look and i see the stars the secret the um fine point and the key to understanding this appears to be to recognize the sense of wonder that it is written with right it's one thing to look at the stars and see you know bright uh blinking objects on a dark canvas canvas or to uh have some you know further knowledge of what's going on there and say so there's a huge ball of hydrogen that is exploding right that's one thing but it's another thing to look at it and be able to see it as a sign of creation um so once one makes that switch uh, like sh sh shifts the point of view and the way Ustad Nursi obviously articulated this is the shift from manai ismi uh you know to to manai harfi to indicative meaning right uh, then it becomes uh, really beautiful and absorbs you in so the secret here is not in the description of the you know facts ab about the nature out there uh, which we can increase uh, today with more, since we have more understanding more knowledge of the, those facts out there but in that sense of wonder and i feel myself uh, successful in reading the supreme sign if i can feel a little bit of that wonder and the more of it i feel the better right so it is an experiential thing in in uh in our experience of reading too um, wonderful Th thank you for your comments i think this is very nice to understand um the supreme sign and uh, what it contains uh colonel john before starting do you want to comment more on this um no i think uh, mustafa put it uh, very succinctly very eloquently um and he mentioned the word sayers to look spiritual wayfaring this is, in a sense, a handbook for the spiritual wayfarer. This is how this is what the spiritual path and the spiritual way should look like. Actually, I see this as normative, prescriptive. I see this as the kind of journey that we should be making. Now we are all making a journey. We are we are all travelers questioning the universe concerning the maker of the universe. But obviously. Um, to articulate it like that sounds as though I'm saying that everyone is doing exactly the same thing. Well, we're not. We're all at different levels. We're all on different paths. They say every road leads to Rome. Believers, unbelievers alike, everyone reads the book of creation. We've said that there are only two ways of interpreting the book of creation. And again, Mustafa Hoja has uh, indicated that these are manai uh, esmi, self-referential, or other indicative manai harfi. And this is, in a sense, is a kind of handbook um, of how to read the creation, how to go on that Abrahamic journey of looking at the signs and understanding that we cannot love those things which set. And at the same time, it's grounded very much in, in a theology of the divine names. It shows us how to actually find the names in creation, how to recognize them, how to celebrate them, how to engage with them. And in that sense, you know, we, we know that our cosmic space, as well as our physical space, has been secularized. Um, this is, in a sense, a resacralization of the cosmos, because it teaches us that at every step, at every, you know, twist and turn of the journey, there are the divine names. You know, there is the face of God, Wajrullah. The face is how we are recognized, and therefore the cosmos is how we recognize the creator. So... In a sense, this is what we should be doing. This is how we should be journeying. And I think the supreme sign, and it's, it's very easy to see it simplistically, um, you know, as just um, several, uh, well, quite a few paragraphs, um, each of which showcases a certain number of divine names, but it's far more complex, far more, um, uh, far more complicated than that, actually. 
Um, yeah, supreme sign is is is. I'm not going to say that it's absolutely sui generis, uh, you know, among all of the different treatises of the Rasal Nur, but it has a very special place. It's very, very special in that sense. So this makes us more excited, you know, to, to read this line by line and try to understand what's going on. Um, uh, then I start. Um, the supreme sign, the observations of a traveler questioning the universe concerning his maker. Uh, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, the seven heavens and the earth and all that is in them extol and glorify him. And there is nothing but glorifies him with praise, but you understand not their glorifying. Indeed, he is most forbearing, most forgiving. Uh, this is the translation of uh, Surat al-Isra, verse 44. Um, and I think I will ask you, uh, that's the supreme sign in the first place, the verse itself, maybe not the three ties, or uh, I will ask your opinion on that. Um, yeah, maybe I should ask, do you think this, this is the supreme sign, actually, uh, based on connotations of Ustad Nursi? Is this this word, this verse, this three ties? Mustafa Hojam, what do you think? Um, I was hoping that Koinoja would have something to say. I was, I was um, hoping exactly the same. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I mean, um, I think this dream sign relates to um, the notion of uh, the created realm being a sign of creation and everything put together. Uh, somewhere Stadnus he says uh, the um, like tarif edigis, so describer. That may not be the right word, but you know the describer of uh, the the uh, of of God can only be all of his works together, right? Um, and even that would not be sufficient, but from the human being's point of view, uh, that's the you know, furthest reach that we can attain in terms of having a ma'arif, you know, right, knowledge of God. So uh, that what imparts the knowledge of God to the human being can only be the furthest point, everything put together. Uh, so the kul, right, the whole, uh, if we use, uh, the, you know, some of the terminology that we do, zaman, uh, Said Nursi has introduced. Uh, so the stream sign I feel is the whole, uh, and and but but the Quran uh, reflects the whole, right? And it is so miraculous that each and every part of the Quran reflects the others, that is connected to to others. So I don't know if we can highlight or. Uh, yeah, highlight this particular verse as the supreme sign or not, but it is certainly pointing to the supreme sign in the sense that everything in the universe is glorifying uh, God, everything one by one and, and as a whole. Thank you. I think it, it was important to draw attention to Quranic verses and the universe as signs. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's good to start. Yeah, I mean, one, one, one thing that was that actually came to my mind as you were reading the uh, translation is, you know, here it says, though you do not understand their praise, that, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that don't even try, you won't understand it, right? You don't understand its praise uh, when you don't pay attention to or when you are not aware of this as a phenomenon, right? And so it's, it's not discouraging people from trying to understand, but rather encouraging them to transcend their limitations, uh, were the limitations that prevent them from being able to understand their uh, their uh, glorification. And, you know, uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu at some point told the, the companions, had they preserved that state that they had, they, they attained in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu they would go out and they would shake hands with the angels, right? Or, uh, you know, when they attain a certain state, they would hear the glorifications of uh, things like say the, the pebbles that he took in his hands. Um, so it is something that we can understand, but we are failing to understand 
uh, because of our limitations and ignorance and uh, sinfulness, right? So right. it is it is setting a, a a goal for us to reach. When we understand, then we will you know start start the the, the journey that he is describing here. Wonderful remarks. Um, Kulnojam, do you have some remarks? Uh, no, not really. I can't really sort of add anything to that apart from to say that it's for most people enough to understand that everything does glorify Allah without trying to actually understand how that glorification takes place. So I think the verse can be understood on, on different levels. Um, our negligence means that most of us don't look and, and although we read, we don't realize what we're reading. Um, and if we read consciously, then hopefully, you know, by understanding that everything does glorify, that is a large part of the battle won. But to understand how, how a tree glorifies its creator, what kind of, you know, paeans of praise does it offer to its creator? How does it prostrate itself? Um, how does it pray? You know, what kind of words does it use? Does it use words? Um, we may never understand that, but I think uh, at base, that at base level, we have to understand that everything does glorify, and I think we can witness that um, without necessarily being able to understand the, the nature of that glorification. Thank you very much. Looks like we have uh, a lot to to talk, but I think it it was a very nice start. Um, uh, this second station, in addition to explaining the above sublime verse, set out the proofs, arguments, and meaning of the first station, which has been skipped. Uh, the first station is the Arabic side, so the first station was in Arabic, so this second station that we're going, of, going over actually is kind of the translation um, of the first station based on my understanding of uh, what Ustad Nursi says. So we are going I mean, we are skipping the Arabic part. That brings us to the, sec um, to the second station. Since this sublime verse, like many other chronic verses, mentions first the heavens, that brilliant page proclaiming God's unity, gazed on at all times and by all men with wonder and joy, in its pronouncement of the creator of this cosmos, let us to begin with a mention of the heavens. Indeed, every voyager who comes to this hospice and the realm of this world opens his eyes and wonders who is the master of this fine hospice, which resembles a most generous banquet, a most ingenious exhibition, a most impressive camp and training ground, a most amazing and wondrous place of recreation, a most profound and wise place of instruction. He asks himself too, who is the author of this great book and who is the monarch of this lofty realm? There first presents itself to him the beautiful face of the heavens inscribed with the gilt lettering of stars of the stars. That face calls him saying, Look at me, and I shall guide you to what you seek. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a good place to stop. Uh, Mustafa Hocam, can I ask you uh, this classification? Uh, I understand here the motivation is the Quran in the first place, since Quranic verses start with the heavens, it start, starts with the heavens. Uh, but here, interestingly, like here, every voyager who comes to, to this hospice and the realm of this world uh, and opening his eyes. So this classification is interesting to me. So uh, like we are looking at this place as a hospice and so that we are questioning the master. Uh, and then we are looking at the generosity. Um, uh, of of the master in, uh, after understanding this uh, and also looks like this place is like an exhibition place so this classification hospice exhibition impressive camp training ground um, place of recreation and also place of instruction uh, can you talk about a little bit of this classification um, and how can we have this 
difference and depth of understanding of this universe. I mean, what is the first thing that strikes my eye that takes me to this different type of classifications here? Um, well, I mean, it, it may not actually strike you as uh, with, with the details of these classifications when you first look, right? Um, but when you look at it with guidance, uh, with guidance from the Quran, then it becomes uh, more obvious. And then you can turn around and you know do the classification. I think you know, if you were to imagine a person who just came to this earth and opened the eyes, right? Uh, for, for me, the first starting point would be that sense of wonder and being honest to oneself uh, in, in one's search for, uh, you know, what that wonder may lead one to, right? If you think of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Colin Hujam, uh, you know, alluded to this saying that this Abrahamic uh, tradition, right? If one, you know, thinks about that, that, that story that we are uh, given in the Quran, right? When he, he's looking for the creator, he is looking for, um, you know, who is in charge here? And he is honest to himself because once he finds who is in charge, he is willing to submit to that, right? So that sense of wonder and uh, being true to oneself, that the earnestness in the search, I think would be the first thing to start with. But once we start with that, we may not be able to come up with such a neat uh, classification, but we would still recognize that things are here um, not randomly. They are not futile. There is a purpose, right? And then we can start to investigate and think about that purpose and we can perhaps come up with some of these things. Yeah. Spring comes, the trees are all blooming, the uh, you know, little plants are shooting from the ground. There's such an activity and there's such beauty in all of this that I can't help asking, so what is this for, right? And then as a point of reference, if, uh, you know, from my human life and uh, understanding, it looks like an exhibition, right? And if there's an exhibition, somebody is exhibiting because an exhibition does not just happen. There's an intent, right? So then I, there I get to recognize the intentionality in all of these, it's not random, it is not futile. And then I can start, you know, going into other things. Uh, you know, th things become hungry, things uh, uh, show needs, and then their needs are being ful fulfilled, right? It, and, and it's not only that their needs are being fulfilled, but their needs are being fulfilled in a, in a way that pleases them. It's not like I go to the hospital and I'm on IV and they, you know, prick my arm in order to put that IV in my, uh, you know, arm and it is painful and, you know, uh, uncomfortable. No, I'm, I get hungry and I eat something, it's delicious, right? So there is something in this, um, you know, things are born, especially, you know, looking at the human beings, uh, we are born and we are born with so little in terms of the capabilities that we demonstrate, but then as we grow, we are, acquiring more and more and more and more. And everything that happens to us seems to be improving us in one way or another. So I can reach the training ground uh, you know, from, from there and so on and so forth. So once we uh, are true to that sense of wonder and true to the uh, outcome that may come out of the sense of wonder, uh, we can recognize the intentionality and from the intentionality, we can go on and start to recognize things. It may not be as articulate and precise as it is here. Uh, and, and at that point we need the, the revelation, right? God does not leave us alone in this world, right? But we get to something. We get, we, we, we can all get to uh, something after recognizing the intentionality and start from there. Yeah, this is, uh, so wonderful. So you're summarizing starting with uh, intentions and also the purpose to be seen in the creation in the first place. 
Kolino uh, Jam, do you want to add to uh, this? I don't, I can't really better anything that Mustafa is saying today, <laughs> mashallah, it's so succinct, so eloquent. Uh, the, the one thing that struck me is that Ustad starts with the heavens, and I remember as a small child, and I think this is probably germane to the subject, um, uh, and all, all small children, I think, have this experience, you suddenly realize that there is something bigger than you, and we look up, I think, intuitively when we're young and we look at the stars and we look at the the moon and the sun and these fill us with wonder as a small child and we are always questioning you know those of you who have very small children I remember when mine were very small it was one question after another continuously and these classifications I think Mustafa is right these are post facto uh, classifications these are the um, what we extrapolate from our journey through a world which gradually um, comes to seem more and more ordered as we grow. Um, so it, it's a recognition of order. I think Mustafa even mentioned the word. Um, it's a recognition of order. And of course, um, that calls for questions. If there is an order, there must be an orderer. And children will ask, it may not be articulated as precisely as that, but children will ask all, all the time, um, you know, sometimes, you know, with the, um, the tongue of mute eloquence, um, this, this, you know, creation, this huge um, sort of cathedral um, of, of beauty, uh, the stars and the, the, the moon and the setting of the sun and all of these things. What, what is that for? It's so much greater than me, so much bigger than me. And if I have a maker, my mother and my father, they are my makers when I'm a child. Who made this? They made me. Of course, that's my illusion as a child. My parents made me. Who made this? Does, does, does all of this have a parent? You know, these are the kind of um, reasonings that a small child is going to make. They may not be articulated in that way. Um, and, and the heavens, of course, um, are where we see the dominical, the, you know, the, 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 the Rabbani bounties are coming from the heavens, the rain falls and things grow. Um, and so this I, idea of, the, we know that the translation is not a good one, dominicality. Uh, I think we've decided that lordliness is not that much better, but probably better than dominicality. The rububia is something which um, in this alam al-mulk, you know, we, we see it as a place of uh, rububia, a place of nurturing and sustaining. And that <clears throat> to, a, for, to a large extent, comes from the heavens. Uh, metaphorically, it comes from the heavens, it comes from above, it comes from the, the spiritual realm, but also physically, and, and uh, Mustafa mentioned the spring, with the spring rains, everything comes back to life. So there's the notion of resurrection as well. So I think it's very apropos that, that Ostad starts with the heavens. Uh, and also I should, should say that, you know, that corresponds to the Alam al-Malakut as well. Um, the heavens is the spiritual side of creation. The earth is the physical side of creation. And I think we start mm. looking upwards at, from a very, very young age, both um, literally and metaphorically. Oh, thank you for reminding us the spiritual side that the heavens represent. Um, I, I want to add something there, if, if, if I may, Harnoja. Please, please. Um, now, I mean, you mentioned, uh, and you said a brother uh, last week mentioned, you know, reading this as an autobiographical uh, text, right? And as Colonel John was uh, speaking, my mind went to, you know, what would have been, what could have been the experience of Ustad Nursi in his childhood, right? So he was born in this really distant village, like you had to, you know, go on donkey or walk there was no way to uh, get there and he lived his childhood there uh, and he lived there for a long time later on in his life too like until, until his 20s he lives in that uh, region and this is pre-industrialization uh, right there is no electricity uh, th there may not even have been like candles around they may have been burning uh, uh, resin wood or something like that so or maybe uh, oil lamps uh, but I remember from my own childhood when we were in the village and we had much less electricity, no street lamps, uh, for instance, going out and seeing the sky. And I'm also noticing that that has not happened for a very long time in my life, right? 
I mean, I'm still referring to my childhood, to the village, uh, when I think of that clarity uh, of the of the sky. So it may be difficult for us, the children of this industrialized modern age, to actually recognize what he's talking about uh, here. Uh, it's it, we 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 need uh, you know we we are all nature deprived. Right. And we right. intentionally, consciously need to try to make up for that in order to be able to recognize uh, texts like this. Um, there is a work uh, by Imam Ghazali, Tafakkur fi Makhluqatillah, reflection on the um, uh, creatures of God or creation of God, something like that. Uh, they, when they translated that into Turkish, they, they translated it as gökyüzüne bakmanın faydaları, the benefits of looking at the sky. <laughs> right? It has nothing to do with the original Arabic, but they translate it as gökyüzüne, yeah, the, the benefits of looking at the sky. So there's something in that. Yeah, yeah it looks like uh, the translator got the connection with heavens. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. So um, we can... We can move if you don't have more things to say. Um, so now we are getting to the heavens. So the face calls him saying, look at me and I shall guide you to what you seek. He looks then and sees a manifestation of Dominicality performing various tasks in the heavens. It holds a loft in the heavens without any supporting pillar, hundreds of thousands of heavenly bodies some of which are a thousand times heavier than the earth and revolve 70 times faster than a cannonball. It causes them to move in harmony and swiftly without colliding with each other. It causes innumerable lamps to burn constantly without the use of any oil. It disposes of these great masses without any disturbance or disorder. It sets sun and moon to work at their respective tasks without those great bodies over rebelling. It administers within infinite space the magnitude of which cannot be measured in figures should they stretch from pole to pole. All that exists at the same time with the same strength in the same fashion, manner and mold without the least deficiency. It reduces to submissive obedience to its law, all the aggressive powers inherent in those bodies. It cleanses and lustrates the face of the heavens, removing all the sweepings and refuse of the vast assembly. It causes those bodies to maneuver like a disciplined army and then making the earth revolve it shows the heavens each night and each year in a different form like a cinema screen displaying true and imaginative scenes to the audience of creation wow it's just one sentence right um and it's it is so amazing i think i'm going to uh, ask you to open this, I think it is very <laughs> dense, you know. This is Ottoman uh, English here. <laughs> um, can, can you just open this? Um, no, you, 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 you've been asking Mustafa first. Yeah, so but I, I just changed my mind. Break, you shouldn't <laughs> now, break now, with now tradition. you can take your turn. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't break with tradition, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, I want, no, no. I want to ask He's being just. You. He's being just. He's <laughs> asking you first now. I, I'm, I'm just absolutely, um, to use a very English term, gobsmacked, you know. I'm absolutely stunned by Said Nussi's, you know, his perspicacity, his very clear vision and the way that um, he can bring this all together in, in, in this very long and convoluted sentence, um, but which I think has to be of one piece because they're all linked. All of these things are linked and they are of a unity. Um, so while it may be in the retranslation, the, you know, a paragraph like this has been broken up and, and rationalized into, into shorter sections, there is a, a kind of perverse beauty 
about seeing Ottoman Turkish, which of course is a, a, a melee of, of Arabic and Persian and Turkish, um, translated um, faithfully. Um, it may not be a, a very elegant, but this sort of long meandering sentence, I think really betokens the connectedness of the universe. All of the things are connected um, and, and they're all logically connected as well as being physically connected. And they are very much of a unity. And how Sayyid Nursi can actually articulate this, you know, uh, reading the creation, interpreting and seeing everything which is happening and understanding every single aspect uh, in a way that is grounded in his understanding of this central, uh, uh, this key concept of order, you know, everywhere you can see order. Also, you can see power and power has been in a sense harnessed and controlled. And he's always, Said Nursi, he's pushing us to think of why should it be so? Why should it be so, right? Um, hundreds of thousands of heavenly bodies, some much bigger than the earth they're all moving in harmony without colliding you know why is that that is the unasked question at the end of each little section here where you see the the um the um what's it called semicolon right it causes, right. It causes innumerable lamps to burn constantly without the use of any oil how could that be you know the unasked question how could that be you can almost hear him saying that it disposes of these great masses without any disturbance or disorder. Why should that be? And at, at the end of every declaration, you can hear or start sort of almost intoning, how can that happen? How can that happen on its own? Yeah, it looks um, like we take all of these as granted. It has to be like that so that we can make fuss yes. or explanation. Oh, it's natural. The, the, the answer, the... The stock answer is, oh, it's natural. Why are you asking these questions? And this is what they say. And what does that mean? It's natural. Even it's I natural remember, I yeah, remember a discussion, not to interrupt you, sorry, just to no, 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 please. add more to it. Um, with a professor, uh, I was reading the first word, uh, you know, over there in the, um, there's an example like, you know, this uh, short roots or soft roots, just cracking the rock. So uh, the professor was saying that this is not a very nice way of telling or it's something very simple because we know this roots has some uh, substances, you know, chemical substances that they discharge so that, you know, the rock is cracked. <laughs> I was very amazed at this time, you know, um, of course, you know, what, what I was amazed was his explanation. I mean, he was satisfied with this, you know, roots providing substance that cracks the rock explanation. He was somewhat satisfied with that. But here, like similar one, it's talking about without oil, you know, the sun just produces energy or um, heat, whatever. Uh, even if there's a, let's say, very good scientist on this astrophysicist, you know, he's going to say that there are this uh, fusions uh, happening, you know, inside the atoms or subatomic particles, you know, cracking, colliding, so that this huge heat and transformations happen. So we can get into pretty much deep explanations on that, but still it's not as eloquent and it's, it's not really explaining anything at all. But they're not giving you an answer. They're, they're right. just making, they're asking more questions. They're giving what they think is an answer, but actually they are provoking more questions, they're making it more complicated and more difficult to answer. And, you know, these are very simple ways of, of describing things, you know, like describing the, the, the sun as a lamp, you know, it's very, very cute. Uh, you know, it's, right. it's, it's very nice, it's very pretty, uh, it's very simple. And of course, this is lowest denominator uh, stuff, you know, he is appealing here to the widest possible audience in a sense. Um, and these are metaphors. These are just metaphors. And, you know, if poets can use metaphors, so can theologues, because theologians can use them as well, you know, and he writes very lyrically, very poetically. And, you know, I, I don't think that a scientist would balk at uh, reading a poem in which the sun was likened to a lamp. So why would they mock here? Um, you know, it, it is a lamp, it's there to, someone has put that there to light our way. 
So it is a lamp for all intents and purposes. Okay, so you may be able to explain, uh, you know, through through invoking physics uh, and and uh, other sciences how the sun burns, but you're still not ask you're still not answering the question: Who made it that way? Right. Why does it have to be like that? And, and these professors, you know, they're professors with zero imagination. Right. Actually, this is also one part maybe I can ask to Mustafa Hocam. I see Ustad Nursi here making use of physics, mathematics, many science of today. Uh, but he's having an abstraction, which is, I think, the, the ability, the capability of a philosopher in, in a good sense. So I see here an abs abstraction that makes use of many different disciplines of today, modern disciplines, let's say. But he's melting them so nicely that, you know, as Colin Oja mentioned, a layman like me can understand what's going on physically. But at the end, uh, I can contemplate upon the creation that touches my heart. Uh, isn't that so, Mustafa Ojan? What do you think about that? Um, yeah, I mean, he is abstracting uh, because he is extrapolating meaning from all of uh, what he's observing in this uh, succinct and poetic, uh, but at the same time, quite technical uh, observation. That's what science would not do. That's what science would uh, you know, see as a sin, right? You cannot, you, you, can, you cannot extrapolate or attribute meaning uh, in, in modern science. And that is a problem. That is a problem. And, uh, you know, we, I, I don't like things to turning into bashing science and scientists, but we need to recognize something going on so that we can calibrate our own minds to being able to understand something like this uh, better. And I believe that we, the, we as the products of the modern age have you know, gone through public education and are exposed to uh, media and consumers and so on and so forth. We are all in need of doing this, including myself. Um, I mean, there are I don't know how many thousand universities out there. Right? They, they say about like 5,000 or so in America, but maybe not all of them are research universities. Let's say all put together, let's say that there are 2,000 universities around the world. And let's say that there are a few million scientists working in these universities to discover uh, various things in the universe. That would indicate to me that we have not <laughs> figured it out, figured everything out yet, right? There is a lot to be discovered out there in the world. Uh, that's why all these people are working and getting the, the, the money that they are getting in order to uh, conduct research. However, uh, the authority that we have attributed to science, and this is you know, mostly a, the, the, the product of a long process of thinking about these things that has originated in Europe uh, and then spread to the rest of the world, the authority we have attributed to science tells us, uh, sometimes subconsciously, that even though this particular thing has not been explained yet, the process of science will explain it one day. And this has so sunk in our thinking that we have stopped to um, think that there might be something wondrous in anything. And this is not my, this is not me, like this is Weber's definition of the. Uh, or, the, or description of the disenchantment of the world, right? The, the process of disenchantment. We are, uh, we are being forced into a disenchanted world uh, by this notion or claim that even though this is not explained today, one day it will be explained. So we defer our uh, sense of wonder to the future, assuming that there is a quote unquote natural explanation for that, right? right. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, doesn't matter how far you go, how much you expose, there will be more to be exposed. And in the end, in the end, it comes down to things that are inexplicable. So the source of all these things that are being explained come to a point where it is inexplicable. And that would be the uh, method of you know, classical kalam, right? Uh, you uh, take things in a, either in a, uh, in an infinite regress and you say that infinite regress is not possible it has to be cut at some point 
right? So right. logically, at some point, it, it will all halt and not be able to pro uh, progress any longer. But our minds are calibrated to not think about that. And also, it is very difficult to think about that, to grasp the entire existence from its you know, potential beginning to now and think that that infinite regress is cut at some point. And that's a very difficult uh, thing to do. So the better way to interact with the cosmos and to, uh, to, to attribute it the, or to, to acknowledge its function as sign of creation, as a guide for us to, that will lead us to the knowledge of our Lord is to reconnect with the sense of wonder and see the intentionality in all of these things. So describing the sun as a lamp you know, it's poetic, it is simple, but at the same time, it is sinful from the point of view of, uh, you know, modern scientific methodology because it attributes intent to it because lamp is something that is, first of all, made, right? Uh, and second of all, made for a purpose. Uh, and it is valuable to the extent it's, you know, serves its purpose and so on and so forth. So it, it provides the human being a point of reference in, uh, that is easily accessible, right? And then sets a cognitive pattern about this thing that you are seeing out there, first is made and second made for a purpose. Now take that cognitive pattern, that line of thinking and go and look at the sun, right? Then you will see what is going on here. This huge thing that you are in is like a palace, and, you know, uh, hospice was, I think the word, but like a palace, like a, a uh, house, like a residence, right? It is made for a purpose for you to inhabit. It is furnished uh, for your comfort and for your needs. And then there must be somebody who made it for you, somebody who is furnishing it for you, somebody who sees your needs, somebody who uh, knows how things relate to one another, somebody who has the power to provide uh, you, you with your needs and so on and so forth, right? It, it, it is... Uh, it calls for a shift in paradigm, right? We, and and to, to recognize that we need to try to recalibrate our uh, minds to be able to see, uh, see all of this. So true. Can I, can, I, can I jump in there? Because please, please. if we're talking about re-enchantment, um, we need the re-enchantment, but I think we're over-optimistic if we think that the scientists are deferring that big question of what is the meaning of all of this until some point in the future when they have become so advanced in their techniques that they are able to ask questions which are actually not questions for scientists to answer because they can't be answered scientifically. It makes no sense. And also they are very disingenuous because when they talk about you know, the things that they shouldn't be talking about, i.e. the creator, and they say, well, we can't know that because we, we can't go back in time. Uh, we can't imagine what was before the Big Bang. So we're talking about deferring things to the distant future and trying to solve questions of the distant past. And this is just obfuscation. They're just trying to swerve us from discussing it because what Ustad says is don't go back to the beginning to try to explain things. He says this explicitly in one part of the Risale. He says, look at the here and now. Who is creating us now? Not who created us then. And this is what the scientists um, want to avoid. And Said Nursi unabashedly, unashamedly, uh, doesn't let them off the hook. He says, we have to ask the question, what is happening now? You know, there's a, I think it's Maulana or one of the Sufi poets says, said, when I wake up in the morning, I don't say, what am I going to do today? I say, what is being done to me now at this moment? So unless we start to ask these big questions, who am I, who is my maker? I have to channel that to the here and now. And the scientists then cannot get away from that. And that is when they will be exposed. But you know, not enough of them have been you know, pushed to the limit to answer that question. And when they try to answer it, they just come up with uh, more questions. So I don't think we have to hold out much hope for the scientists, unless they are enlightened. And we know that most of them aren't. Thank you, Colonel Jom. I like that you um, talk about uh, 
the, the questions of now. So science is kind of postponing, deferring the questions of now and the essence, essential questions of now. Um, I remember recently seeing a paper or article um, which is talking about the God of the gaps concept and just he's claiming or she's claiming that the God of the gaps concept is applicable to science as well. So science or scientific people are filling in the gaps, you know, with science as, you know, one scientific community claims that, you know, uh, people of faith are, you know, filling in the gaps uh, by the God. So I think what you say is clearly matching this argument too. Also, they're looking in the wrong place. You know, if you want to go hunting bears, you don't go to the river. You go to the forest, you go to the hills. The right. river is for fish, you know. And if you're not going to find the creator by doing experiments in the laboratory, you may be able to reveal things about the divine character and see all of the names at play. But, you know, they have a wrong conception of what a maker is supposed to look like. Um, and that's part of the part of part of it is our fault, really, as uh, theologians, by our bad explanations of how we understand God. And uh, Muslims are not to be excused either. Um, until we um, characterize our Creator in the right way, and still, in, instead of describing Him in, in in a in a way that would make even a, a village headsman embarrassed if you described Him that way, we have to start being. Um, being more, you know, uh, vigilant in how we use words when we're describing our creator. Exactly, right. Um, uh, very good points. Um, let's finish this part. Looks like I think we have enough time to end up and I think it's a nice stopping place. So this was the very first part of the uh, second station. Uh, so there is within this dominical activity, a truth consisting of subjugation, administration, revolution, ordering, cleansing, and employment. This truth, with its grandeur and comprehensiveness, bears witness to the necessary existence and unity of the creator of the heavens and testifies to that existence being more um, manifest than that of the heavens. Hence, it was said in the first degree of the first station, there is no God but God, the necessary being, to whose necessary existence in unity the heavens and all, the con all they contain testify through the testimony of the sublimity of the comprehensiveness of the truth of subjugation, administration, revolution, ordering, cleansing, and employment, a truth vast and perfect and to be observed. Mustafa Ojam, can you talk about um, these verbs a little bit? Subjugation, administration, revolution. I know it is very short time, but yeah. just to conclude how Ustad Nursi connects, you know, these verbs to what he described above. One thing that comes to mind actually is if we were to look at the Turkish or Arabic, because they are borrowed into Turkish from Arabic, all those words are they're all active words, active tense, right? They all have object so the word uh you know cleansing could possibly be you may be cleansing yourself right or, or revolution uh, is the worst in that sense that it's difficult to uh, convey the sense of tadweer right making to make revolve it's not the world revolving but something or somebody making uh revolve so uh this all i would say points to the agency of an active agent who is making it all right so you look at and you see say um the sun serving those who are on earth as a lamp right so that's one step in our understanding of what's going on we saw that there's an intent here it is not just an object out there that is you know burning hydrogen and so on and so forth but it is an object that has a function it is not futile it has a purpose and one of those purposes is that it is helping people uh, or uh, beings on earth uh, with, with, with its light right so this is one step to see the purpose but the next step is to see who is 
making it happen to fulfill, who is making it fulfill its function. Like what's the power behind this? What, what is the will behind this, right? So with subjugation, um, right? we get to that. With uh, administration and making revolt, making or ordering, so all the the recognition of that, that that recognition that there's an agent out there, it is not happening on its own, is the next step that we get from the intent. And uh, Ustad Nursi uh, in the Qatra, right, the, in the Mathnavi, the, the the drop, the fifty-five languages of the universe that he identifies there use a lot of these things. So it is not only the uh, six uh, realities he's talking uh, about here that are combined into one reality together. There is more to this, more to this, but in this particular uh, segment of the cosmos, I think he suggests that this is more obvious. Subjugation more obvious. administration is more obvious. So nice. Um, Colin Ojam, can you have your last words and maybe a prayer to finish with? Um, I'll leave the prayer to Mustafa Ojam because we don't see him very often and it would be sure. nice for him to bless us with a prayer. Um, no, I think what Mustafa pointed out, you know, we have to maybe rethink these words and instead of subjugation, use subjugating, you know, there's a truth which consists of subjugating because that obviously indicates agency, administering um, making um, another word for making something revolve, maybe ordering, cleansing, and employing. I think that would have possibly expressed it uh, less ambiguously than, than than we see here, because we, it's the agency that's important there. But no, I, I don't have anything else to add to that. Okay, Mustafa Jam, can can we get a prayer from you to close with? Okay, I like to defer to to Skoda Jafar, but okay, I'm put on the spot here. Okay. <laughs> Um, oh God, help us um, see the wonders in your creation and help us follow those wonders uh, to their purpose, which is to know you, uh, to help us to connect with our, sense of, with our sense of wonder so that through it we can see your signs in the creation and we can come closer and closer to you. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim wa akhir al-dawahu man alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen al-fatiha Thank you everyone. See you next week, inshallah. Thank you very much for your wonderful um, administering of this session. Yes, mashallah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.